you'll just see incredible videos, um, pictures. It's awesome. I tried to cut it. I know Slayton says there's, there's a lot of pictures. I tried to collage it. I tried to cut down. I wish I could have all the pictures in here. But y'all, I could do a whole hour on just all the pictures I've taken. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, but it's amazing because our church is in the community. I mean, I could have a list of everything we're doing. It's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, Dan and Julie, what was it? Thanksgiving, 7.50, 7.30 on Christmas. I mean, God is good, you guys. God is good. And we've been encouraged. Um, Pastor Slayton left us um, at the end of 2021 and encouraged us to uh, um, prepare for battle. Not in the sense of, oh, let's fight, let's get ready, let's have our picket signs. No, let's, let's guard ourselves with prayer. Let's, let's prepare for battle, right? Let's prepare for battle. This is evil times, right? And, and then as we, as we cross over into missions, oh, it's incredible. It's incredible to see how things are going and we get to continue this encouragement today. And I cannot wait. I'm very excited. So uh, this is a little glimpse into today as, as to what we have done throughout our little Hernando County. And you just never know the lives that we touch today, where they're going beyond Hernando County. So thank you, church. Just ask the ways If they are still at the mention of his name They'll say my God is still the same Ask the walls If they still fall at the mighty sound of praise They'll say my God is still the same When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail?
right. That was awesome. Thank you very much so. So, as you know, Slayton, Pastor Slayton's gone, and so we are kind of doing a little bit of missions emphasis. And that was missions here in Hernando County, and I have the incredible privilege to have Jared, Pastor Jared, I'll call him Pastor Jared, up with us, the Hain family. We had the privilege to work with them in Paraguay as well. From day one, uh, they've shown nothing but maturity, and uh, they have just, for being such a young family, in their 20s, coming to the field, right? What are you, 24? 20, how old were you when you came? 23 years old. And his wife, Leah, well, how old were you then? Oh, okay, 24. So you guys are both about the same age. And uh, just an incredible amount of maturity right from the beginning. Super sensitive to the Lord's spirit. And um, it's just really, um, he has invested in me probably a ton more than I've invested in him. An incredible, incredible young man of the Lord. And so we have the privilege to hear him speak today talking about God's heart for the world, which I absolutely cannot wait to hear. So come on up, Jared. Yeah, give him applause. I never know what to say after introductions from Travis. <laughs> the only thing I'll say is just lower your expectations. All right? uh, let me see here. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know how all of you are doing. Um, I had a rough week, right? And didn't exactly have all the time in the world that I thought maybe I would uh, have to maybe prepare something. But um, yeah, so with that comes a lot of just feelings of like, oh, well, what's going to come out of my mouth, right? But uh, yesterday I was just kind of encouraged with the thought that God doesn't change and God's word doesn't change, right? And so man, being able to rest in those truths and uh, I've had the opportunity recently just to be working through Ephesians just on my own. And in chapter 1, looking through all of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And it says in Christ, in him, numerous times, right? Showing that he's the cause of those things. And man, just struck me and hit me. And it was one of those things that sort of just calmed my heart. It provides rest for our souls, right? So anyways, uh, I'm here. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to do this thing. And we're going to have fun. So uh, I guess I just wanted to start by showing a picture of my family and they're here today so make sure you say hi to them because uh, they're way cooler than me <laughs> um, yeah my wife Leah and then we have two children Gabriel and Shiloh and uh, so yeah we um, are all here and it would be an honor and a privilege if you just shook our hands and said hi to us uh, no hard sell just want to put a face with a name we like to do that it would truly be an honor to us so just make sure you say hi please um, at any rate uh, yeah for the last seven and a half years we have lived in Paraguay and I had the privilege of, yeah, getting to know Travis and John. And I hope you guys, like as a church, realize how blessed you are to have them here now. Because our greatest, most fondest memories <laughs> of life on the field all include the Whitman family and the Quas family. And uh, those are some of the most special moments that I think I've had, not just on the field, but even in life. We've spent a lot of time shooting the breeze as we would drive through mud and <laughs> other fun things. So <laughs> we're getting lost on motorcycles with John. <laughs> like, those are all stories we can share later. But at any rate, um, I guess we will pray and then we'll get into a message I've entitled God's Heart for the World. And what I hope to do is to um, share something that's maybe not so profound in the way of like new information, but maybe profound in the implications that hopefully it will have for each of us as we see that God has been focused throughout all time on the nations and on reaching people uh, with the gospel. So we'll pray and then maybe we'll get into that and we'll see how this goes. So God, I just thank you for your faithfulness and your love and that you're unchanging and that your word doesn't change. Um, thank you that uh, we have new life in you and that we can rest in the things that are true of us, um, that you tell us who we are and you tell us who um, we are in light of your son and what he has accomplished on our behalf. We couldn't earn it, we don't deserve it, but you give it to us freely, and we thank you for that. Pray this morning that we would just be challenged by your word, and that we would be encouraged as well, and that through it we would um, come to understand your purpose for us here on this earth in reaching people. In your name I pray, amen. So James Mishner, I don't know how many people have ever heard that name, how many people are familiar with his books, but James Mishner is an author, and uh, it's actually been kind of like a bucket list item for me to actually 
uh, maybe read a book by James Mishner. Um, I've gotten through like halfway and then I end up giving up, right? Started Centennial, which is about Colorado, but inevitably I give it up. Uh, he's kind of known for writing these big, thick, dry books uh, about geography and locations, all right? So uh, he has books written about Alaska and Texas, the Caribbean, uh, Hawaii. He chooses these locations and he kind of like writes about those locations, okay? Um, so the interesting thing about his books is that he covers like massive scopes of time. Like he'll start way back at the beginning of time. Unfortunately, he takes like, you know, the evolutionary type perspective, but he'll cover like work his way from like lava and magma, <laughs> magma, like all the way up to like dinosaurs and then maybe like, you know, people, indigenous peoples that maybe lived in that region and so forth. So why is that interesting to me, right? Well, it's not necessarily the book itself, but or the, the style of writing so much as it is about the author himself. Because uh, James Mishner never actually knew like where he was from. So James Mishner, he never really knew who his parents were, or where he had come from. The only thing he knew is that he was adopted at a young age by these Quakers in Pennsylvania and raised that way. Um, but he never truly discovered where he was from. And so Mishner would write about these locations as if he was from that location, or as if he was the location itself. He kind of had to like imaginatively, is that a word? Um, um, I don't know, use his imagination to sort of like write about this location as if he were from that area. Now, what does that exactly have to do with missions, right? Um, that's a really good question. But um, kind of where I'm going with this is that we all have a story that we live by. This is called a meta narrative or a master story. Maybe you guys are familiar with the word worldview, right? Okay, the lens that we see the world through, right? But in missions, we talk about this idea of story, this master story, this meta-narrative that we live by, and it tells us where we came from, where we're going, who we are, and it answers life's most fundamental questions, right? It gives us meaning and purpose, and we make decisions in light of this story without even knowing it all the time, right? Worldview is subconsciously embraced, and we don't really question the way that we do things. We just do it because that's the way it's always been, right? But we've embraced kind of this master story and we make choices in light of this story so an example that probably sounds a little nebulous meta narrative right and master story and so forth but an example of this would be like the typical american north american like worldview right uh i would say that most would say that you know there's this primordial soup in the beginning and there's this big bang and through billions and billions of years of the evolutionary process you know life has evolved and here we are today in the 21st century, and because of that, life doesn't really have intrinsic value in and of itself, right? We're just the process of billions and billions of years of evolution. So how does this impact me in the life choices that I make? Well, um, if I think that terminating life in the womb uh, is the right choice for me, I, I can do that, because life doesn't have intrinsic value in and of itself, right? Uh, life is seen as somewhat meaningless in a sense because we didn't really come from anything and we're not really headed anywhere, right? Kind of sad, but that's like what a lot of Americans believe, right? Well, another example for us as believers, we have rejected that master story. We've instead adopted and embraced God's master story, which is his word, the Bible, right? And what we find in his master story is an all-loving God who created mankind different than he created any other thing in the world, and that he desires to have a relationship with mankind, right? Um, and that uh, he desires intimacy with us, right? Uh, we see that we're created in his image and in his likeness, right? This gives us intrinsic value. This gives us meaning and purpose in life, right? It tells us who we are and where we're going. It has a beginning and an end. And so this gives us reason to even stand up for weaker, those who are weaker who have no ability to defend themselves, like uh, a baby in the womb, right? So without lingering like too much on this topic, um, what I would hope for us to see is that God's word is a master story. And uh, just like any other story out there, it has a beginning and a middle and an end. And it also has, it's one book with one major theme. And we'll kind of go down inside that. But, you know, I find it interesting, like, you know, nobody would like pick up a, bu a book, right? And just like open up in the middle and start reading. 
But we do that with God's word all the time. And maybe like you, if you're like my wife, she'll like read the conclusion. She like, it has to end good. Otherwise, I'm not going to read it, right? <laughs> like, maybe there's some of us like that, right? Um, but like we read books in a chronological way. So why do we do it differently with God's word? Why do we flip open to random passages and we say, oh, that, that sounds good. I'm going to apply that to me, right? We do that all the time. But God's word has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it has a theme. It's one book with one theme, just like any other book out there. So one book with a beginning and a middle and an end, if we were to look at this as a timeline, uh, John, last week, I'm told, sort of like zoomed in, like right there on the cross, right? The incarnate Christ, you taught on that, right? Okay. (laughs) Uh, So I trust you're all blessed by John and his message because John is an amazing human being and uh, has a deep understanding of God's word. So I trust that was awesome. But he sort of zoomed in on the incarnate Christ, the most important part of the story, the climax of the story, if you will, right? What I want to do this morning is like zoom all the way back out, and I want to look at God's word as a whole, right, from beginning to end. And my prayer is that you will see missions in an entirely different way, and that it will impact your thinking radically, right? That's a tall order. Uh, But that's my prayer for you all uh, today. But the reason I chose to slip this in here, this timeline is here, uh, in here, is not only so that we could see God's word laid out in a timeline uh, way, but also to show our part in the story, okay? Because we're a part of this story as well. So God's word uh, has one book, it's one book with one major theme, right? Well, that's not to say that it doesn't have anything to say about us. Sure, we like to pick and choose and whatever, and maybe we could do a better job at that as a church, right? (laughs) But uh, overall, it does have things to say about us. There were entire epistles written to the church, right, that are written for our understanding and for our growth and maturity. So starting off here, and we haven't quite got into the book of Genesis. There's a lot of buildup. But if I were to ask you where missions is in the Bible— like, what would you say, you know? When I was asked this question, you know, I'd be like, oh, well, maybe, maybe the one with the Great Commission in it, you know? Uh, and that's a good response, you know? That's a good example of missions in the Bible. Uh, maybe some of you would be reminded of Acts 1-8, right? Another really famous, well-known verse that exemplifies very well missions in the Bible. Uh, maybe some of you have a personal favorite verse, right? For me, Acts 26 18 says to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light. And from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. These are all really great verses that exemplify missions in the Bible. But I think we're missing something. So what I would like to submit to you today is that we can't reduce missions down to one single verse. We can't reduce it down to even a handful of verses. What I would like to submit today is that missions is one of the major themes and focuses of the entire Bible. But unfortunately, what we have done, all right, as a whole, as a culture maybe, is we've made ourselves oftentimes the main character of the story. We've a lot of times reduced God's heart for the entire world down to just us or our family or maybe just our church, and we kind of focus in on ourselves. And again, don't get me wrong, there are things that are written for us. The Bible is very personal, uh, personal and it was written for you, right, that you would know him. Uh, There are entire, again, epistles written to the church. But I don't want to lose our focus in seeing what God's word as a whole has to say. So, God's word is one book with one major theme. And I believe that one of the major themes and focuses of the Bible is missions, okay? So that word, like missions, can be somewhat nebulous, right? (laughs) Maybe some of us, when we hear that, we're like, oh yeah, Navy SEALs. Uh, you know, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise, you know, whatever. Um, I don't want to leave you guys in the dark, you know, it's just like missions. Yeah, Mm, okay, cool. You know, so I kind of want to give you guys a little definition. It's the same definition that was given to me uh, 13 years ago when I was in Bible school. Missions is God's pursuit of mankind to restore a relationship that's been broken by sin. I'm going to read that again here. Missions is God's pursuit of mankind to restore a relationship broken by sin. It's a simple definition, but the more you think about it, you're like, oh, (laughs) you know, can you see where I'm headed here now? And like God's word as a whole is God's pursuit of mankind to restore a relationship that's been broken by sin. And 
And man, I would love for you guys to like remember this, man. Like, I don't know, write that down, or, you know, on your forehead, just kidding. But, um, you know, have that in mind. Like as you're talking to people now, we're talking about missions emphasis and whatever. What comes to mind when you think about missions? Man, I would love for you just to remember this, this definition here because I think it's a great illustration. There's a couple of things that I guess I want to highlight in that is that, that it's God's initiative, right? It's not man pursuing others to restore a relationship. It's God's initiative. God is the one that has been pursuing mankind throughout all eternity. The moment that mankind shook their fist of rebellion in his face, he pursued them. He desires relationship with mankind. He didn't have to man, uh, include us in that process, right? Man has an important role to play in this, right? And we'll get to that. But overall, it is God's initiative. He is the one that is pursuing mankind and desires to have relationship with them. And so, like I said, we've oftentimes made the Bible all about us. And so some questions that I think we should ask for ourselves is this morning as we sit here, and I'm sorry the red doesn't show up very good, but it says, what is, like, the questions that we should be asking are not, what is God's will for my life, right? But instead, what is his ultimate will? What is it that God wants? What is it that he's shooting for throughout all time? Not, how does God fit into my life or my dreams, but instead, how do I fit into his? Because I think oftentimes what I've noticed in my own life is that I have a tendency to try to conform God to my messed up way of thinking as opposed to conforming my thinking to his and considering all things under the light of his word. So that's sort of the introduction. I know that probably took a long time, but now we're going to like blast through this thing from beginning to end. So we're going to start right in the beginning, Genesis 1 to 11. And in it, we're going to see some key things in creation. Uh, we're going to see God's promise to send a redeemer uh, following the fall of man. And we're going to look at Noah and the Tower of Babel. So I'm going to have all the verses up here and uh, buckle up. So at any rate, <clears throat> in Genesis 1, we see an all-powerful, all-loving God, right? He creates by the mere power of his voice, and at the end of everything that he creates, what does he say? He says it was good, right? Now, when God says that it was good, it means it was perfect, right? And not perfect by our standards as fallen human beings, right? But perfect by an all-powerful, perfect God standards, right? So it was good and perfect, and it was whole, but when God wants to make man, he does it very differently, right? As we've already kind of mentioned, he didn't just speak man into existence. What we see is God forming man from the dust of the earth. The Bible says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being created in his image and in his likeness, right? We are the pinnacle of his creation. But God gives man work to do, right? He makes a woman uh, from Adam's rib. And it says here that God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it <clears throat> and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here's what I think is interesting about that, right? God didn't want just one or two worshipers on the earth. God wanted an entire earth filled with people to enjoy intimacy and fellowship with him in a perfect world, perfect creation to enjoy intimacy with him an entire earth filled with this right <clears throat> doesn't take long though right he gave adam another command a choice if you will to obey him right and therefore show him love or disobey him and choose death right uh, we know this story well so genesis 2 16 to 17 says this from any tree of the garden you may eat freely but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for the day that you eat from it you will surely die so god didn't want robots, right, who are hardwired only to love him. Um, <clears throat> you know, robots, they don't have any choice in the matter at all, right? God gave mankind a will, and they could choose. And in Genesis 3, 6, we see that choice being made. It says here, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, when mankind made this choice, right, it didn't just impact them. Now, I used to struggle with that as a kid all the time. Like, how did Adam's sin, like, way back here, like, impact me way up here, you know? But, like, being a dad, man, I see that my choices have impact on others all the time. <laughs> it's just the natural fact of life that the choices that we make impact others, right? <clears throat> it's a fact of life. So whether good or bad, our choices have the potential to impact other human beings. And when mankind 
made this choice to, uh, choice to eat this fruit, it radically impacted mankind for all eternity. But there's hope, right? Like God could have wiped man from the face of the earth and never created again. God could have wiped man from the face of the earth and started over, but he didn't because God loves us, right? And God promised to send a deliverer, right? A redeemer, if you will. And in Genesis 3.15, we see this happening. It says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. You know, that used to confuse me all the time, like as a kid, right? Um, sounds like a confusing passage, but God is promising to send someone, right? He's speaking to the serpent here uh, in the Garden of Eden, cursing the earth, and he promises to send someone that will bruise him on the head, right? The thing that I want to point out here is God was never obligated to do this. Nobody forced God to do this at all, right? But God loves us, and right here at the very beginning of the story, Again, when mankind shook their fist of rebellion in God's face, he chose to pursue them. That's a remarkable thing. Nobody forced God to do that. God took the initiative and chose to pursue mankind to restore the relationship that had been broken by sin. So, man, this is God's mission. From the very beginning, we see him pursuing mankind to restore the relationship that's been broken by sin. Man, what love, right? <clears throat> Well, it doesn't take long <laughs> before we find ourselves uh, in a similar situation, right? Things kind of progress. Here we are with Noah, Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, right? Again, God could have wiped man from the face of the earth, um, <clears throat> but he didn't. You know, we might think that, but he didn't. He preserved Noah and his family, all right? And what command did he give Noah at the end of that? The same command that we see at the beginning, right? Genesis 8, 17 says, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Again, God isn't looking for one or two worshipers of his on the earth to enjoy intimacy and fellowship with him, right? He wants an entire earth filled with worshipers of his. And God commands them to multiply, to fill the earth, that there would be millions of people around the world who can enjoy this intimate relationship with him. Once again, mankind doesn't want to listen, right? Tower of Babel. Genesis 11.1, 1, we see that the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And instead of filling the earth, they said this instead. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, right? <laughs> oh, man, this is the complete opposite of like what God had actually commanded them to do, right? Rather than filling the whole earth with worshipers of his who are enjoying intimate fellowship with him, they say, you know what, like, we just want to stay here. Like, we're just going to make a name for ourselves, right? That's what they wanted to do. <clears throat> so what's God res God's response? Genesis 11:8 tells us, it says, So the Lord scattered them abroad uh, from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city, you know. We're not given, like, a ton of information of, like, what this looked like, right? But one thing I know and can say for certain is that God did a really good job. You know, you, you guys, like, need to take time and ask John about Nivakle and just some of the intricacies of that language. Like, John's got the mind for it, too. He can talk your ear off all day about, well, this is why the verb does X, Y, and Z, whatever. I used to literally call him from Paraguay and be like, man, what's going on in San Fana? You know, because I was just so confused. But, man, these intricate difficult to understand languages, you know? You go to my friend's house, like, first time I ever sat down with the son up and I, hey, I want to learn this and that. And uh, <clears throat> I said, hey, how do you say see you later? You know? In Spanish, it was just like, you know, nos vemos, you know? Not too bad. He says, <laughs> I was like, sorry, what? You know? So I put my computer up. It took me like a week of just like, just trying to like slow that thing down, you know? I'd break it down. Ol, 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 wait, ol, wait, ol, ol, wait, ol, wait, ol, wait, you know? And then build it up until... Finally, I was able to say it, you know. But see you later. That's one sentence. It's also one word. So it's very interesting. But he did a really good job. Okay, and he scattered them over the face of the entire earth. But God has a plan, right? So here we find ourselves kind of entering into the plot of the story. We've already seen how much God loves man, right? How he's pursued them even from the beginning. We see that. As soon as they rebelled him uh, against him, he pursued them. Well, we see that same focus here, 
And absolutely, yes, we will, right? <clears throat> so Abraham, starting with Abraham, Genesis 12, um, kind of 1 to 13, we read about this man named Abraham, right? He's told, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and so you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. <clears throat> you catch that last part there, right? And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You know, I think a lot of times we read this story, and we're like, oh, yeah, Abraham's going to get blessed, you know. But God had a plan to bless the entire earth through Abraham. It wasn't just about one man. It was actually about what God was wanting to do on the earth, right? He wanted everybody to know him. He wanted everybody to have an abundant, joy-filled relationship and fellowship with him. That was God's heart. That was his desire. But we don't just see this in the life of Abraham. There's a lot of Old Testament examples, right? We could probably spend all day looking at different examples that we see in the Word. <clears throat> but I just want to check out a couple of these Old Testament examples. The Ten Commandments, we, re uh, we read this. It says, Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So Israel was supposed to be distinct and different from any other nation on the earth. Why? So that other nations would look at Israel and say, you know what, we, we want what they have. A real relationship with a real God. Like, you know, we've got these fake wooden idols, whatever, you know. They were supposed to be a light into the earth that when other nations saw them, they would realize there's something different about them. Now, unfortunately, Israel spent too much time wanting what the other nations had, right? And, uh, you know, God has, and I'm sure you guys maybe have looked at this, but God has sort of temporarily benched Israel He's now working through the church, right? That's us, all right? I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here in the story. But uh, one day he will resume the plan that he has for Israel, and that he'll fulfill all of the promises that he has committed to them, right? But essentially what we see in the Old Testament is Israel was to be a light into the world, that people would look at them and say, man, there's something different about them. They have a real relationship with God, and we want that too. Well, Solomon in his wisdom says here, men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Why did God give Solomon wisdom, right? Just for the sake of giving him wisdom? Well, you know, he did ask for it, right? Well, man, he wanted uh, people to realize, man, where does Solomon's wisdom come from? It comes from God, a real God, an all-powerful God, right? About Solomon, his dedication to the temple. <clears throat> and may these words of mine with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no one else. You see, the focus again is that everybody would know that the Lord is God and that there is no one else. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, therefore I, Nebuchadnezzar, decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, for no other God can save in this way. Right? Daniel in the lines then, I, Darius, issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Man, in every single one of these examples, we see that God is focused not on just the individuals and the story, but the whole earth or the nations around them. He didn't just give wisdom to Solomon for the sake of giving him wisdom, right? He wanted the whole earth to see him, the all-powerful God of the universe, who gave Solomon that wisdom. He didn't just rescue Daniel from the lion's den because he was a stand-up guy, right? Um, he didn't just spare him from the furnace for the same reason, right? He wanted the entire kingdom, the whole earth, to recognize that Daniel's God was the one and true God and that there was no one else, right? That was God's desire, that everyone would see the real God behind the scenes working these things out. Well, man, what about David, right? David is known as a man after God's own heart, right? And the Psalms, which are primarily written by David, are filled with verses like this one here. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. Man, even when David faced Goliath, like I love to look at the focus of like where David's attention was at, at you know during that that um time you know we read that passage like i remember reading that passage as kids right and just being like man you know david conquered this giant like we can conquer anything like we can do anything we put our minds to right that is not god's 
that was not David's focus in that story, right? Nobody wanted to fight Goliath. You know, David steps up to defend the name of the Lord. You guys know the story, right? Um, he's small. He doesn't have any armor or weapons, right? He's just got this sling. He goes out, and even before he killed Goliath, this is what he said, that the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, that the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel. He wanted the whole uh, earth, the entire world, to know that Israel had a real God, and they had a real relationship with him. He wanted everybody to know that he was the creator of the universe, right? So the story of David and Goliath has nothing to do with us, right? It has everything to do with a big God making himself known to the world. But somehow I think that we've missed that, haven't we? Somehow we've made ourselves the focus of the story, right? We've made ourselves the main character. Um, we even like to take verses and like chop them in half and put a dot, dot, dot at the end of them because it sounds better, right? Let me just give you an example, right? <clears throat> Be still and know that I am God, dot, 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 right? Like if we were to go right now like to the closest Christian bookstore and walk in, we'd walk past like, you know, all of the like precious moments figurines, maybe some of the cool Christian t-shirts, the newest albums that are out, our hundreds of Bibles of translations in our own language. And maybe on the back wall, we'd see like this painting. You know, it's got like a cabin on a lake, maybe a dusting of snow. Maybe for you guys, it's palm trees. I don't know. But, you know, this cabin's got like smoke billowing out of the chimney. And what do we see on that? Be still and know that I am God. How many of us have actually like memorized the second half of that verse, right? We all know this part. How many of us have actually taken the time to memorize the second half of the verse? This is what it says. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That's the end of that verse, okay? That is the end of that verse. That's what it says. He doesn't just want one person to know him. He doesn't want one family to know him. He doesn't want 40 nations to know him. He wants the whole world to know him. He wants the entire earth to have an intimate relationship with him. That is his desire. Somehow, we've missed it. But Jesus didn't. Okay, God, he knew what he was doing, and he went so far as to send his very own son, Jesus, who paid, obviously, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, right? His focus was on the world, right? And you guys sort of zoomed in last week. You looked at the incarnate Christ with John, right? And I know that that was an incredible blessing to you. I don't even have to say I hope. I know it was. <laughs> but Jesus, right, his missional focus as he came to earth to become for us something that we could never pay ourselves. The plot continues to thicken, right? This isn't the end of the story, but it is the climax of our story, right? It's the peak of the story, but it isn't the end, right? So God's promise way back at the beginning of time, Genesis 3.15, God promised to send someone, right? He promised to send someone. As soon as Adam and Eve uh, made the choice to eat that fruit, God promised to send someone. And his name is Jesus Christ, right? There's a million examples, but these are just a couple examples um, here, right? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come says here in Luke 4:42 they tried to keep him from leaving them but he said I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent the mandate obviously that he gave to his followers go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation so all throughout the gospels we see Jesus's focus was on the entire world man John 3:16 right for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Man, we may have missed what God has been doing throughout history, but Jesus didn't, of course, right? The Bible tells us that obviously he came and he paid the price that no one could ever pay in and of themselves to rescue us from our sins, right? But don't lose focus here, right? Missions is God's pursuit of mankind to restore relationship broken by sin. He did this for the nations, but he also did this for you personally. He did it for you as an individual as well. And just like God pursued Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Just as he has been pursuing all people from all nations ever since, he's pursuing each and every one of us right now. For us to have intimacy with him, or if we're unbelievers, if we haven't actually placed our faith in Christ, he's pursuing you because he wants you to know him. Man, like if you haven't done that, I trust 
everyone here probably has, but man, that you would talk to your pastors afterwards and just hear how you could actually have that intimacy with Christ and have an everlasting relationship with him. There's no better deal, right? You just place your faith in him and believe. You're not going to find a better deal. It doesn't get better than that, right? <laughs> Anyways, but this is what God wants. He wants all people to know him. Jesus' focus was on the world. It was on the nations. Well, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave a mandate to his followers, right? And the focus of that mandate was to reach the entire world with the gospel message. So Acts 1.8, right? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Later on in the book of Acts, we read, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. That was Paul, right? Called to take um, God's name to the Gentiles. Paul later writes this, right, to Timothy. He says that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man uh, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ra uh, ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. So God's heart for the world remains unchanged. Even to this day, God is still pursuing mankind, all right? He is still pursuing us. He is still pursuing people in all nations. But there are literally millions of people around the world who have yet to hear this message. And God has chosen to use us in that process. In God's infinite wisdom, he chose to use mankind in this process. And man, what a privilege we get to partner with God in this task, right? The best job of all time of taking the gospel to people who would otherwise never have the chance to hear. It is remarkable that God would choose to do that. He could have just snapped his fingers, but he said, you know what, I'm going to use my people, the church, to do that. Earlier, we kind of uh, were looking at the timeline here. I kind of want to go back to this for just a moment. Again, that red underneath church didn't show up. It says, you are here. So I want to go back to this, right? If the Bible were a timeline, we'd see a beginning, a plot, and an end, right? And uh, we see the cross there representing Jesus as payment for our sins. You know, the arrow pointing up, he ascended into heaven, right? And one day he is coming back for, uh, for us, okay? And right now we're in this age that we call the age of grace or the church age. And it is our job to carry the message of the gospel and to share this message with as many people as possible. That is what we are here on this earth for. Like, why didn't God just say, you know what, the moment people place their faith in me, I'll just take them home. He left us here for a reason, and that reason is to share this message with as many people as possible. Man, there are thousands and thousands of people around the world who remain unreached, okay? Unreached because they either live in a place where they've never had the opportunity to hear it in their own language, in their own culture, and they remain isolated geographically, uh, but also linguistically and culturally. Sometimes these groups live right on the edges of town but they still maintain their own language and culture. Nobody's ever taken the time to actually invest in their language and culture, to learn to be able to communicate Christ to them in a clear way. Man, they're just like us, other than a little maybe skin pigmentation differences there. I have a funny story about that with Sanapana. You can ask me later. But <laughs> The only difference is that we had the great fortune of being born in a part of the world where we had a translation in our language and where we had churches on every corner. They were born, and they had the great misfortune of being born in a part of the world where they didn't have access to that. Not because they chose that, but just because that was the hand they were dealt. Nobody's ever taken God's word to them. But this is our job right here as the church, to take God's name and his word to places where it has never been before. Well, I certainly wish I had more time to go into every single one of these verses here. Um, I throw these up just to simply show that missions isn't just God's pursuit of mankind as something that we see in a couple of verses in the New Testament, but to show that it is a major theme and that God is focused on reaching the nations, okay? So these are just a couple of verses that exemplify that, that I just don't even have time, and there's probably more than this. But at any rate, we've seen our place in God's master story. Okay, we've seen from beginning to end that God is pursuing man to restore a relationship that's been broken by sin. I just want to look really briefly together. This is my favorite part, but it's the worst part. 
because I can never do it without crying. So at any rate, we're going to look at the conclusion, the book of Revelation. So Revelation 7, 9, we read this. After this, I looked, and before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Man, how beautiful is that, right? In the end, we know that God wins, right? God gets what he wants. There's not just a bunch of white people from North America standing around the throne. Instead, we see worshipers from all around the globe, and not just one or two, but we see men from all tribes, tongues, and languages. This is what he has always wanted. This is what he desires, and this is what he is shooting for, even today as we are sitting in this room together. So this isn't just you know, fantasyful thinking, as we might think. Sometimes we read Revelation, we're like, oh, that sounds good, you know. This is a reality. This will happen, okay? Um, this is a reality. And there will be worshipers praising him from all corners of the earth. And man, like, as a Penn State fan, <laughs> I have to brag on our stadium a little bit, Beaver Stadium, right? Beaver Stadium is the second largest stadium in the United States. It's like fourth in the world. Beaten only out by Michigan. <coughs> Just gag saying the name, right? Uh, back in the day, you know, Penn State would build, and then Michigan would build a little. They'd just go back and forth fighting, right? Um, but, you know, Penn State has over 106,000 seats in their stadium, but their record is actually 110,889 that they've had in there, okay? And uh, despite being second largest in the United States, there's no question about which stadium is loudest, okay? Especially during the whiteout game, uh, Penn State Stadium is a rockin' place. So much so that the chemistry department actually had to build, it measures on the Richter, uh, the Richter scale, so they had to literally build the chemistry department underground off campus because on Saturdays it was so loud that it would mess with their like experiments and stuff. That's how loud it is, okay? So it was a pretty rocking place on a Saturday. But man, this day right here is going to be like a tea party in a library in comparison. Or sorry, <laughs> I said that wrong. My, my Penn State's whiteout game, the loudest game that they have, will be a tea party in the library in comparison to this day here. Hopefully I said that right. Um, but yeah, comparing the two is just like, unbelievable what we see is just man it's like yeah you know they say we are Penn State you know everybody going nuts that's nothing in comparison to what this day right here will be when people and worshipers of his from all around the world from all corners of the earth are there together on that day praising the lamb so this is the part this is the worst part sometimes I don't even read it because I always end up crying but I just love this passage here okay and I'll try to get through it, but <clears throat> it says, Then I saw, this is the very end, this is why I share this, right? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, It is done. And the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable murderers and immoral pers persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Sorry for the uh, spelling error there. But at any rate, this is what God will have in the end, when all things are made whole. God reconciling man and all things back to himself. So from cover to cover, we see an all-loving God pursuing mankind to restore a relationship broken by sin, and one day we know he will get exactly what it is that he desires, his ultimate will, that all people 
would know him, right? So here's just in closing the big idea, okay? I want to look at this really quick and then we'll finish. Missions is God's pursuit of mankind to restore a relationship broken by sin, all right? So the question that I have is, how will you respond to what God is doing around the world? There are millions of people who have yet to hear this message. What are we willing to become in order to take part in what God is already doing around the world, right? So for us as believers, right now in the church age today, the question is not whether or not we will be involved, but rather what role will I play? Because in one way, shape, or another, this is something that was commanded of you. Once you placed your faith in Christ, God has an expectation that you would, he's entrusted you with the gospel, right? To whom much is given, much is required. So how will you respond to that message today, right? That's the question that I think all of us should be asking. Not, man, God, what, what do you want for my life, right? That's an important thing. I don't want to undermine that. But man, how can I fit into what you're doing around the world? How can I play a part in reaching people with the message of the gospel? We'll close in prayer here. I think I got enough time. <laughs> All right, God, thank you for your word again, Lord. Thank you that it doesn't return void and that we can count on it. Uh, thank you for the truths that are in your word. And we know that you're going to be faithful to do all of what you've said. Just as the sun rises every morning, just the way you made it, we will see these things happen as well, God. Thank you that we can trust that. We can have confidence in that. Just thank you. Pray that as we go from here, we would continue to be challenged by your word and desiring to take uh, your name to people who have never heard it. Thank you um, just for the time that I've had to share today right here at Gateway Bible. And in your name I pray, amen.